It's my pleasure this evening also to introduce our keynote speaker, but before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge the United States Institute for Peace, whose grant made it possible for us to bring Professor DeWall to, to campus. When we began planning this conference, uh, what seems like an eternity ago, um, we immediately reached out to Alex DeWall to deliver a keynote address, and let me explain why. One purpose of this conference is to assemble human rights researchers and advocates um, for a dialogue that may help us think more intentionally about transformative solutions to systemic patterns of injustice. Right. We wanted to bring scholars and advocates together. Alex Duvall virtually embodies this combination, scholar and advocate. Another purpose of the conference is to facilitate critical introspection and a con constructive critique of the human rights movement, its work, and its advocacy strategies. And anyone familiar with Alex DeWall's work knows that he has been an outspoken critic of human rights, humanitarian and development work when that criticism has been warranted. So you can see why we reached out to him and we're grateful, Alex, that you've accepted our invitation. Alex DeWall is the executive director of the World Peace Foundation and research professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He earned his doctorate in social anthropology from Oxford in 1988, having written his thesis on famine in Darfur, Sudan. This became the basis of his book, Famine That Kills, published by Oxford in 1989. That book was the first of five books he has published to date. He's been a prolific scholar. In addition to five books that he's uh, authored, he's edited six collections and published scores and scores of book chapters as well as articles in scholarly journals and leading publications around the world. His work as an academic and an advocate has made him one of the world's foremost experts on Sudan and the Horn of Africa, indeed Africa. The scope of his work is remarkable. He has critically examined famine, humanitarian crisis and response, conflict, peace building, HIV AIDS and governance in Africa. His Afri advocacy work is equally remarkable. After earning his doctorate, Alex Duvall joined African Division of Human Rights Watch, uh, but left in protest after Human Rights Watch took the decision to support U.S. intervention in Somalia in 1992. After leaving Human Rights Watch, Professor Duvall became the first chairman of the Mines Advisory Group at the onset of what would be the international campaign to ban landmines, which would later be afforded the Nobel Prize for Peace. By the end of the, <clears throat> he was just getting started, Professor Duvall founded two human rights organizations, Africa Rights and Justice for Africa, whose work focuses on documenting human rights violations and developing responses to humanitarian crisis in Rwanda, Somalia, and Sudan. By the end of the 1990s, he turned his attention to health in Africa and wrote extensively about the nexus between poverty, governance, and HIV AIDS. And so after completing a two-year fellowship at Harvard in 2006, he directed a project in HIV AIDS and social transformation for the Social Science Research Council. And during the same period, he was the principal author of four major reports on HIV AIDS on the continent, one of which described HIV AIDS as Africa's greatest leadership challenge. And in 2006, he published an important book on the impact of AIDS, AIDS and Power, Why There Is No Crisis Yet. Professor Duvall is also well known and widely respected for his work on Darfur in 2005 Professor Duvall was asked to join the African Union mediation team for Darfur and then became the senior advisor to the African Union high-level implementation team for Sudan. Professor Duvall was the principal author of that panel's 2009 report entitled The Quest for Peace, Justice, and Reconciliation. Two of his books focus on the conflict in Darfur as well as the broader problems of demilitar demilitarization, excuse me, peace and security in Africa. Professor Duvall was appointed executive director of the World Peace Institute in 2001. Now, uh, this can obviously only be a brief synopsis of Professor Duvall's uh, immensely important work over many decades, but the important thing and the reason we immediately reached out to him to deliver the keynote at this conference is this. Alex Duvall has consistently and cogently challenged the human rights movement to engage in the kind of critical introspection we hope to that we hope that will take place during this conference. Back in 2003, in an article that appeared in the Journal of Human Rights, Professor Duvall wrote this, within a single generation, the principle and practice of human rights has undergone a remarkable transformation 
overwhelmingly we can regard this transformation as a good thing. But when an idea emerges from such marginality to command such powerful assent in government, international organizations, and society at large, at, at very least, it deserves our critical scrutiny. We fully concur. That's the purpose of this conference, and that's the reason we invited Professor Duvall to deliver the keynote address. So please join me in welcoming Professor Alex Duvall. Really, it's, it's a pleasure and, and an honor to be here. And I'll, I'll actually start by adding one thing to my CV, which you probably would not have known about, which was prompted by uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero appearing here, which is at the time of the murder of Archbishop Romero, my father was dean of the cathedral in Canterbury in England. And it was a cathedral which is filled with tombs and monuments to medieval saints. And my father surprised the, the canons of the cathedral by proposing that one chapel be actually dedicated to the saints and martyrs of the current era, 20th century saints and martyrs, beginning with Archbishop Oscar Romero. And, and, and that chapel was consecrated just uh, uh, a few months later and has been visited by uh, uh, many others, many, many religious and political leaders. And in fact, I was at the Carter Center the other day, and President Carter has a painting of that, uh, of that chapel on, 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 on his wall. So I was able to um, send my father, who's still alive, a, a, a signed uh, picture of President Carter standing in front of that. And, and, and I think that sensibility um, that, um, of, of, of awareness of the, the, uh, uh, the moral challenges and the, and the spiritual dimensions and the, and, and the constant quest for intellectually understanding that, uh, the challenges that we face was, 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 was as it were, uh, imbued into me from, from, from early on. Um, in, the, in this lecture, I want to take a slightly shorter view of, of, of history. I don't plan to go quite back to, to medieval days. Um, I want to look at the, uh, provide an outline of the social and political production of human rights advocacy over about a 200, 250 year period, and explore how social movements and human rights organizations relate to the deep structures of political power in the form of the modern nation state and what is increasingly replacing it. And, and I don't think it's, it's contentious I don't, to, to argue, uh, particularly to this audience, that human rights advocates must understand the political context in, 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 in which they are working and understand that globalization requires uh, changes in practices. What I hope is, is, is new in this uh, account that I'm going to give is an analysis of precisely um, what is happening in the, in, in the transformation of structures of political authority in large parts of the world um, under the impact of, of, among other things, globalization and, and the uh, war on terror and its legacies. So the first part of my talk, I will look at the account of the origins of, the, of, of social movements and human rights advocacy reaching a zenith in the last years of the Cold War, a, a paradigmatic form of activism that emerged um, at, that, uh, at that point. Um, and then the encounter between human rights and humanitarian activism, which I would argue created a sorcerer's apprentice that we are living with now, which we have to seriously critique. And then the second part of my talk, I want to look at how um, Political structures of political power have been changing and are being profoundly changed in the global uh, periphery. And I'm going to argue that one of the neglected aspects of globalization is the development of a, a globalized patronage system, um, which brings us also back here, back home, because the United States, uh, for good or ill, is at the center of that system. Um, so I think it would have been anachronistic 
to speak of a human rights organization or a social movement before the middle of the 18th century. Um, it was Enlightenment philosophy that gave birth to the idea of universal and secular human rights. And it was around this same time that the repertoire of the social movement, so ably described by the historian Sidney Tarot, was first developed, centered upon meeting and petitioning. These were the elements of, the, of that repertoire and the use of the newly emerging print media. And of course, it was also at this same historic moment that in, that in a few countries around the world, in Holland, first of all, in England, in Scotland, in, 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 in uh, North America, what became the United States, and in France with something of, uh, something of a bang, um, that, the, that the modern nation state emerged. And the political scientist Douglas North describes this as a historic transition from a limited access order based on patronage and, and, and which power is in the, in the person of the ruler to an open access order in which power is institutionalized in the, the state and not in the person. The historian Charles Tilly saw, sees it, or saw it, he passed away, saw it as a grand historic bargain between a ruler who needed to raise an army and the landed and mercantile elites who had the resources, including above all the labor and the money um, for that venture. So as the state made war, state making, uh, um, war making made the state. And the economist Mansour Olson saw this as the last stage in the transition between the historic form of a predatory ruler, a, a roving bandit who, who looted, and a, and a stationary bandit who, who, who taxed. Now one of the, so the, the, the state emerged as a, some sort of protection racket. Um, but one of the notable features of the parallel emergence of modern states and social movements is that they shared and contested the same space of communication and convening. The states did not monopolize that power. They did not have that ideational power, and, that, and they did not control the mechanics of communication and convening. And the first and most important human rights struggle were for freedom of conscience, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. And here we have a great exponent, Tom Paine, um, who, who, who wrote his, 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 his famous book just across the road in Islington from where Human Rights Watch had its London, uh, uh, London offices for many years. So following Richard, the philosopher Richard Rorty, the social critic Lily Shuliriaki, identifies the origins of modern humanitarianism at this time, particularly in the writings of Adam Smith. Now, Adam Smith was famous for writing The Wealth of Nations, uh, the, 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 the classic um, uh, theorization of capitalism. But he also was a writer on moral sentiments. And those two writings of, of Adam Smith need to be read together. Because his core concern was how the combination of universal human moral sentiment and the amorality of the market created a need for solidarity. That, and, and, and that was the origin, of, I, I, I would argue, of, of um, the, the, the humanitarianism, the, the feeling of, of solidarity and, and human empathy that lies behind um, many aspects of, of the modern social movement, including, most importantly, transnational activism. Um, the American and the French uh, revolutions, of course, espoused universalism, but they were not truly transnational. Um, Tom Paine, of course, was active in, in, in England, in, in, in America, and, and in France. But although his friend Mar Mary Wollstonecraft wrote about the rights of women, that solidarity was not really extended um, to Latin America, and certainly not to, to, to Haiti. They were decidedly ambivalent about revolutions in other parts of the world. And in fact, this, this famous picture was originally written to mock the ideals of the French Revolution. Um, it was written in the spirit of racism to say, you know, how, how can you be universalist? Look at, you know, a, 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 an African cannot possibly be a man and a brother. But one of the the most fundamental characters, characteristics of liberal activism is its, uh, is its sense of irony and its sense of, of 
reflection, its ability to be self-writing, to mock the double standards of those who deny, who espouse a high principle and deny it to some people. So this which originally was, this, this image which was originally to mock the universalism and the implicit um, anti-racism of, of the French Declaration of Human Rights then became uh, uh, part of the standard of the anti-slavery movement um, in, in, in initially in, 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 in Britain. Um, and within that campaign, that first real transnational campaign to ban, the, to abolish the slave trade, we can see a tension, an, an interesting tension that persists to this day between three manifestations three genealogies, if you like, of the social movement, of humanitarianism, of human rights and philanthropy. One is human rights as salvation or fulfillment. Much pre-modern philanthropy was premised on the idea that you could purchase um, the salvation of the soul. Um, this was a, 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 a popular idea among those who, who, who erected lavish mon monuments in Canterbury Cathedral in the Middle Ages. Now, modern manifestations of human rights activism have also been deeply personally fulfilling for those who engage in them. And Peter Benenson, who founded Amnesty International, wrote in a private letter a very interesting phrase. He, and he, he explicit, and as he was founding Amnesty International, he recognized, and I quote, the importance of, sorry, the quote starts here, the importance of finding a common base upon which the idealists of the world can cooperate. Those whom the amnesty appeal primarily aims to free are the men and women imprisoned by cynicism and doubt, i.e. people like us. Um, now, a, 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 a particularly remarkable recent version of this is, is with the charity Action Aid. Um, this would be appropriate for a headline in The Onion if it were not actually true. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I'll just read one line, you know. Um, from their promotional material. Get involved, feeling inspired. ActionAid supporters experience incredible feelings of happiness, warmth, and pride all the time. There's no limit to the scale of amazing feelings you can get by getting involved. To discover what your feeling might be, take the ActionAid interactive quiz today, and it promises this will take less than 60 seconds. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm not making this up, I really am not. Um, and of course, the, the activism as self-realization is particularly possible when the subjects, the ostensible subjects of the activism are in a different continent and can't answer back. Um, a second tradition is philanthropy as the means of sustaining the social order. And when Queen Elizabeth I of England um, uh, promulgated the poor laws. She did so because uh, the monasteries having been uh, abolished, uh, England having parted company from the Roman Catholic Church because the King of England wanted a divorce and wanted to get his hands on the uh, monastic riches. Um, all those poor people who used to, to congregate in the monasteries for alms were then turned loose and were a threat to social order. So the, the idea of, of, of organized state charity or parish charity de um, derived from that. And the more closely the Elizabethan Privy Council studied the problem, the more systematic their charitable giving got. And, um, and two and a half centuries later, Bishop William Wilberforce, who was one of the main abolitionists in, in, in Britain, was a deep social conservative at home. He was a follower of, of uh, Edmund Burke, the, the conservative philosopher, who believed in a very slow pace of reform, essentially in order to preserve the status quo. And a lot of charity has that at its, at its root. And of course, one need not one should not overlook the fact that many conservative causes also are very well mobilized as social movements, including global social movements. There's an interesting book by Clifford Bob uh, that takes as one of its case studies the way in which the National Rifle Association in this country uh, extended its influence into Latin America to support the, uh, uh, with expertise and funds to support efforts to, to stop any restrictions on firearms ownership in Brazil, unfortunately, successfully. Um, and the third um, strand is, is, is change, including radical change, transformation, revolution. Now, let's, 
The, the language of human rights is, is, is a language that pretends that it's not about power. Human rights activists like to pretend we're not really involved in politics. Well, that's not so. It's, human rights has, from the outset, always been about influencing state power, getting legislation, using state power, even controlling the state itself. The Anti-Slavery Society, the first transnational human rights organization, actually financed gunboats. Um, the, and, 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 and implicitly actually encouraged colonial adventures to, in the name of, of the abolition of slavery. This is a, a picture of a, of, of a uh, Royal Navy warship, HMS Brisk, um, intercepting a, a, a slave ship in the 1850s. Um, and in the 20th century, we see the legacy of this. We see the continuation of this. And I put these pictures up because they illustrate a very important and I think under-recognized strand of uh, the international human rights movement. The, the civil rights movement in this country, exemplified by the person of, of the Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, was in the 1950s and into the 60s one and the same as the movement for the independence of African countries. And there on the left you see Martin Luther King with Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah brought independence to his country by peaceful means. He was a Gandhian. He believed in what he called positive action. And, um, and, and, and he was successful. Um, and he invited uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, um, he invited uh, Martin Luther King and his wife Coretta to, to that ceremony in 1957 when the British Union Jack was lowered and the Ghanaian flag was raised. And he cried, free at last, free at last, free at last, the same words that King himself used a few years later, the Lincoln Memorial. And the words that, that Nelson Mandela used um, when he uh, also won the elections and accepted to become president of South Africa in 1994. Um, on the right-hand side, you see uh, Martin Luther King with Kenneth Kaunda, uh, the, who became president of Zambia, who was also a Gandhian. And there, Bill, uh, a very young and lean Kenneth Kaunda on the top, and a rather older and stouter Kenneth Kaunda underneath, receiving the Mahatma Gandhi Award from the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, who was, until just before giving that award, was a member of parliament in, in, in the South African uh, National Assembly. Um, it was about, so those were movements about the political kingdom. And these, these are two uh, nice pieces of artwork. One, one thing that the, that the uh, Lusophone uh, liberation movements had in common was they were led by poets and artists, and they had by far the best artwork of, of, of any liberation movement that I've come across. And, and, I, and the one on the right has a lovely and beautifully ironic slogan, liberty in our eyes. Because, of course, they achieved liberty from the, uh, the colonial power, but the subsequent post-colonial uh, history of Angola uh, cast a shadow. Um, so for two centuries, neatly bookended by the French Revolution in 1789 and the Velvet Revolution in 1989, social movements in developed countries and transnational human rights organizations contain varying mixtures of these elements. And they existed in a state of symbiosis with the states that they challenged. And when Peter Benenson coined that inspired term, prisoner of conscience. Of course, he meant the individuals imprisoned by repressive regimes, but the modern state itself was imprisoned by those Enlightenment ideals. The hypocr as hi hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue, vulnerability to shaming was the price that Enlightenment but abusive governments paid for their ideals whether they're in the Soviet bloc or the Western bloc. Those states had made provinces, promises to their citizens in their laws and their constitutions and their ideals. And they couldn't escape that Enlightenment inheritance. And it was this double standard that was so brilliantly exploited, really by Helsinki Watch and America's Watch, conjoined to become the creators of Human Rights Watch in the late 1970s. And during that decade, the 1980s, the two watch committees leveraged 
in a fabulous way, the gap between the ideals and the reality in both blocks. And it was superbly balanced, dealing even-handedly with the communists, the communist totalitarian regimes, and the, 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 the US client authoritarian regimes, especially the generals in Latin America. And while, in terms of the US clients, while the primary targets of what America's Watch was pointing at was the, those rulers themselves, the secondary target increasing in importance was the US State Department and Department of Defense. And the greatest triumph, of course, of this, uh, of this movement was the Velvet Revolution in Europe and the less dramatic but also hugely significant absorption of human rights concerns into the very bloodstream of US policy making in Congress and the executive. And this was a tremendous achievement. And thereafter, the, the, the human rights movement, um, focusing on civil and political rights, sought to maintain this superbly effective method and apply it elsewhere. And it's interesting that um, Ken Roth, in a, in, in a much quoted article in 2004, explaining why Human Rights Watch was moving to, to deal with economic, social, and cultural rights, emphasized that, the, um, let me read what he said. He said, many who urge international root groups to take on economic, social, and cultural rights have a fairly simplistic sense of how this is done. Emphasis his. And, and then he goes on to talk about human rights methodology. Other approaches may work for other types of human rights groups, but organizations such as Human Rights Watch that rely foremost on shaming and the generation of public pressure to defend rights should remain attentive to this distinction. So his primary concern, his primary criterion was the method rather than the principle. This is a departure from his predecessor, Arya Naya, who had a, a, a very uh, philosophically grounded, somewhat doctrinaire view, I would uh, argue, about um, which rights should be taken on. And, 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 and in the 1990s, Human Rights Watch began to take on um, a whole lot of extra issues. You know, uh, began to take on the Shell Oil Company, for example, in Nigeria. Began to take on uh, large rebel movements like the Tamil Tigers, like the Sudan People's Liberation Army, um, criticizing them for their, their, their human rights abuses. And for the most part, however, Human Rights Watch and other human rights organizations did not take on the peacemaking business. They didn't engage directly with conflict resolution activities other than rehearsing issues, such as the importance of denying impunity to the perpetrators of war crimes. They kept a critical distance from the politics of peace. Now, where I think they made a mistake is they didn't keep a critical distance from the politics of humanitarianism. There was a fascinating debate in the early 1990s about whether Human Rights Watch should get involved in the issue of famine. And, and I was involved in that debate. And I argued, yes. But I also argued that Human Rights Watch should not simply be in the business of arguing that humanitarian organizations ought to get more money and access. There were other particular issues that, to do with the human rights abuses that created famine or allowed famine to occur that it should focus on. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't merge or meld in any way with humanitarian organizations, which I was rather concerned were making compromises in order to get access, in order to actually do their practical work, were making compromises with nasty regimes, with, um, with warlords, and actually were and ending up um, confounding situations. The practical necessities of delivering r relief, which I respect, were getting in the way of, of sticking to principle. Now that critical di distance was, that critical stan stance was abandoned, and, and Human Rights Watch supported an intervention in Somalia in order to make, uh, in order to, to make um, the, the activities of relief agencies secure. Um, that was the reason I departed from Human Rights Watch. Um, and the consequences of becoming an advocate for that type of intervention is you are advocating an end you are advocating to achieve a certain practical goal. 
how do you distance yourself from the means that are involved? And 20 years ago this week, there was a, a, a terrible battle in Mogadishu in which several hundred Somalis were killed and 18 US servicemen were killed, um, which led to the withdrawal of, of, of the US from Somalia. I, I, had been in, I was in Mogadishu just prior to that, in the middle of this, this battle, and I went uh, and I saw horrible abuses by both sides, by the Somali militia and by the United Nations forces, including by the US. And I took my copy of Geneva Conventions, marked up in various places, to the military attorney, an American who was the chief military attorney for the US. And he brushed me aside. He said, you know, the United Nations has not signed the Geneva Conventions. They don't apply here. And I took a, you know, I, I was slightly astonished by this. And he, and he uh, asked me to come back in two days' time. And in, in the meantime, they issued instructions that if I did come back, I would be arrested. Um, and this concept of humanitarian impunity was there. That because what the UN and the US were doing was right, therefore, the means for getting there were also right. And, and, and we see that, that merger, that, um, that fusion between human, human rights principles and humanitarian practicalities across the board, including on fundraising, including in the imagery and the presentation. I mean, it, it, if you're a murderer or a rapist, you have a human right to be presented, but no humanitarian is ever going to put your face on a poster. The humanitarian narrative is, is, a fair, is a salvation fairy tale. It is appealing to your emotions, to your pockets, to fund what they do in order to save other people. And, it, and, there, and, and there are many things that they do which are very, very good, but it is not the same as human rights. And I think that that marriage created a, a sort of mutant offspring. And that mutant offspring was... was uh, interventionism was a, a latter-day philanthropic imperialism. And it began in places like Somalia with the humanitarians in the lead. Then the humanitarians began to get cold feet about this because they saw that the intervention was actually not delivering for them. And you don't see those humanitarian agencies like Catholic Relief Services or CARE calling for intervention in, in these places, in Congo, in, in, in Libya. And, and also the human rights organizations themselves having you know, dabbled in these waters have also recoiled, but there is an offspring, and we saw that in the Save Darfur movement, calling for uh, military intervention in Darfur at a, at a time and in a manner that all those such as myself who were familiar with Darfur were thought was a very ill-considered. Um, this concept, the, the particular manifestation of this sort of mutant child, this sorcerer's apprentice, was genocide. And the, and, and, the, and, and the way that the concept of genocide, which of course has its legal meaning and is subject of scholarly study, but the, the function that the concept of genocide plays in this policy discourse is to rationalize exceptionalism. It is to say, here is something that is so evil that we can throw out the rule book. Here is something where the the rules no longer apply, and we can, we can make an exception. We can abrogate international law. We can discard the UN Security Council and all this apparatus of international law that has been set up. The cry genocide has become a, a cry for uh, intervention, exceptionalism standing above the law. And, of course, Samantha Power is the, the particular embodiment of that, uh, that, that narrative. I think... Um, this is a project that places the United States above international law, seeking a higher legitimacy than law, and surely this is a dangerous idea that should be ringing alarm bells. So let me now move on to the second part of my presentation, which is actually going back to the analysis of state power. Um, the conventional wisdom of international development, and I will be testing you all on what this means afterwards, um, is that countries require expert assistance and, ex and, and outside resources in order to expedite a transition from a patrimonial uh, limited access order to an institutionalized uh, uh, proper state. 
from a, a, a fragile state to, to, um, to a secure state. The most sophisticated version of this is the, this is the World Development Report of uh, 2011 by the World Bank, Conflict, uh, Security and Development. It shows this spiral. Yes, there can be setbacks, there can be bumps in the road, but basically that's the trajectory from you know, a, a country like uh, Af Afghanistan or Sudan today to a country, well, maybe if not like Sweden, a bit more like you know, Spain or something like that. Um, and there are parallels here um, with the, 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 the model developed by Catherine Sikink and colleagues, the boomerang model of, of, of transnational activism, the way in which a combination of norm development, uh, uh, information, uh, act, uh, practical assistance, etc., uh, uh, can uplift the, uh, the norms and the standard of governance of a country. Um, both these models have much to commend them. In many cases, they have worked remarkably well. And they've been very important in deepening our understanding and guiding our action. And let's not mock the progress that has been made. Um, there have been enormous advances in global ethics over recent decades. Look at that. That's the decline in the deadliness of wars. You know, we, we can be pretty proud as a human species of having achieved that over the last 50 years. And, and, and that's a tribute to a whole lot of things, including the human rights movement, including the, the, including the United Nations, including the, you know, the, 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 the diplomats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Angel of Our, Angels of Our Nature, documents much of this. But there are a few oddities. That, have, that are arising, and I want to point to those because I think in order for this trend to continue to be consolidated, we need to, to, to attend to those wrinkles and iron them out and, 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 and make sure that it's not, it, it's not just a linear decline. There, is a, there are some very important structural changes afoot. One oddity is Mali. Now, I'm not sure if you, how good everyone's geography is on Africa here. Um, we all know that the Malian state collapsed 18 months ago, a sort of perfect storm of secessionism, extremism, drug trafficking, coup, corruption, you, know, you name it, Mali was suffering from it. A state that was eviscerated, penetrated by, by, by all sorts of evil things. And, and, and the response was, first of all, an African intervention, which was rather slow-footed, and then a very rapid French military intervention. Now, over the last few years, a lot of data sets and indices have been developed by people to predict these sorts of crises, and the best known of them is by foreign policy and the um, uh, Fund for Peace, the Index of Failed States. Um, now, if we turn to the data published just about 18 months ago, 15 months ago, uh, middle of 2012, based on data up to the end of 2011, Mali doesn't appear on the list. It's there in orange, not red. In fact, in, there's a list of 191 failed states, a sort of inverted list. Somalia is at the top and Finland is at the bottom, 191. Mali checked in at 78. It was sort of on a par with, with India and China, more or less. Now, we may not like, we may have problems with India and China, but they're not about to collapse in the way that Mali collapsed. So what was, what was going on there? Why, why, why were we missing it? And, and pretty much all the other indices um, measured Mali in the same way. They simply completely failed to, uh, to, 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 uh, to hit it. And, I, and, and I'll come back to, the, I'll, I'll give you an answer later on, but it's, it's odd. And even today, when Mali is completely prostrate, it's only 35 or 36 on the list. Um, where are we? Um, 38 on the list. There's another oddity is, is the fact that um, Samantha Power, who gained her professional reputation as a fearless advocate for human rights, wrote a hugely influential book on genocide, another book on, on one of the leading lights of multilateralism, you know, um, Sergio Vieira de Mello, should become a proponent of an act that every lawyer that I've spoken to, um, and I've spoken to a few, says it is illegal, bombing Syria. We're all outraged at Syria using chemical weapons, but um, countering one illegality with another does not, in the first instance, seem like a very good idea. 
And that the, another oddity that the principles of multilateralism, of international law and of international cooperation to find peace and a, a resolution to the chemical weapons crisis should have been championed, should perhaps even have been salvaged by none other than Vladimir Putin of Russia. That's odd, something is going on here. Let me not catalog some of the other oddities. Let me, let, let me explain um, why I think our, our existing models don't work. This is the, the stationary bandit model um, of, of, from Mansour Olson. And, and it, it's, it's one in which the ruler has the, has the guns and the intermediate elite, elites, the feudal barons and the merchants and bankers have the money and the labor. And the protection racket is an exchange of resources for protection. But the disposition of the states in Africa and the greater Middle East over the last 25, 30 years is very, very different. In the 1980s, all these countries, apart from those that had massive oil reserves at that time, or mass massive oil production at that time, went through an economic crisis so deep that the political scientist Robert Bates described it as an experiment in pushing the values of key governance variables to points at which political authority was no longer viable. And, but they recovered. And as they recovered, a variety of political regimes emerged. We had rentier states in some highly centralized rentier states in, in places like Egypt and, 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 and Syria. Um, we had more or less sort of um, democratic patrimonial states that had the facade of democracy. Mali was one of those. And then we had a, a particular type of state that I would call the political marketplace state. And a good example of that is Chad. There are, um, it, Sudan is even better, actually. Let, let me take the example of Sudan, but many other examples, Yemen too, Yemen, Somalia. Basically, in order to fight wars, what the rulers of those states did in the 1980s was they licensed militia and they licensed their own commanders to supply themselves. And as they recovered as rentier states, what that meant was that the ruler had the money and these intermediate elites had the guns. So the other way around to the Mansour Olson thing. So instead of the state emerging from a, a grand bargain of a, of, a, of a protection racket, you actually had extortion rackets, minor extortion rackets of militia, tribal chiefs, rebels, um, even the state's own military commanders holding the government to ransom, saying, you give me money or I'm going to go you know, block the main road, blow up a police station or whatever. And, and th this is not a state, it's a system, it's a rentier system, an extortion racket in which violence becomes a tool of bargaining. It's the story also of Afghanistan, I would argue. And, 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 and this is what happens to many of those other states, the more centralized rentier states, like Egypt or Syria, when central authority disintegrates. They don't become a democracy, they become more like this. It's one, what happens to those, the, those sort of soft democracies like Senegal, like, uh, like, 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 like Mali, when they go into crisis, they become like this. Um, so, a couple of other features of these states, these systems, I should say. They're not good candidates for becoming nation states on the European model because they're far too diverse, very ethnically diverse. So the challenge facing the ruler is not how to consolidate and build a state. It is how to maintain my authority in a, in a, in a, in a very difficult and diverse state in which I don't control uh, the means of violence. So the model is not the nation state. The model is something else. And the best model that I've come across in the literature is the Ottoman Empire. Also happens to be the place that actually covered many of these, these locations historically. For, and, where, and the Ottoman Empire lasted for some eight, 900 years, which is quite a long time. It didn't become a nation state, but it did meet that, that basic criterion of the rule of maintaining authority. And the historian Karen Barkey describes it as a hub and spokes with no rim. So this is the hub and spokes. You have the, the metropolitan center, and then you have all the provincial centers. And the way that the, the, the empire is maintained is that the center negotiates bargains with each of its provinces separately. It comes to a separate deal. And 
in Karen Barkey's account, that allows for diversity because each one can, can have its own deal. But of course, in the, over the long term, that diversity pulls it apart. But I'm more interested in, in the convening and communication element of this because this works in a, 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 a society where the technology of communication is very rudimentary and the, 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 the bargaining, the convening and the bargaining and the communication is set by the center. There is no communication between, or virtually no communication amongst those, 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 those provin uh, provincial rulers. So, it, so the, the marketplace works on a retail basis. The, the ruler is, is, is like a doctor in his surgery, and he brings the patients in one by one, gives them the medicine, etc., etc. Now, of course, this has all changed. You have cell phones, you have satellite phones. When I was in Darfur in the 1980s, working on famine, I didn't make a single phone call in the two years I was there, not one. The only telecommunications I had was over a police radio. Um, now, sat satellite phones, cell phones, you can call anywhere in the world, from anywhere, literally. And meanwhile, the, the, the presence of international NGOs with their land cruisers and their helicopters and UN agencies and so on in these remote areas means that there's a lot more physical communication. People can actually meet. They can, uh, they can meet not under the, the, the auspices of, of, of the state. So you have a model like this, um, where you have a lot of weak links amongst these, uh, these peripheries. And this has many, many, many ramifications. And I'm just going to run across a few. The first and most obvious one is for negotiations. Our model for negotiating an end or mediating an end to a war, the classic model was here in Dayton. You get a bunch of leaders, you lock them away in a place, um, you seclude them, you basically shut the door and you say, talk it out. And you give them very limited communication with the rest of the world and you come with a document that they sign solemnly and they're going to stick with it. It's a sort of once in a generation convening and, 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 and coming together. Contrast that with the, the Darfur peace process, where, which I was part of. And we would come to a document. We'd have a document, and, it, and, and the senior political leaders, you know, Bob Zellick from the State Department and, and, and others would be there saying, sign this thing. There's been no change to it. And then the, the rebels would get on their cell phones or their satellite phones to Tripoli, to, to Chad, to, to their friends in Washington, to wherever, and they'd, say, and they'd come back, no, 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 we're, we're going for a better deal. Whatever they signed was only good for that day for as long as those market conditions persisted. Um, we see the same sort of networked networks at work in combat. An old-style rebel movement, hierarchy, discipline. You know, the soldiers would be drilled. They would have a battle plan, and they would, you know, they'd be communicated, and then communication shut down when they went into battle. Now it's all done on the spur of the moment with sat phones. So rebels in Darfur, of all sorts of different political colours and names, will coordinate. For a day, they'll overrun, they'll loot something, and then the next day, they'll be coordinating with somebody else. So in the Sudanese, the Sudanese vernacular, how they describe this is as a marketplace of loyalties. Um, uh, the souk, allegiances are rented to, to the highest bidder. And the result is a political system that's turbulent. People joke in these countries. In Yemen, for example, they say it changes every day. You come back after 10 years, it's exactly the same. Um, turbulence is that characteristic whereby you know, it's unpredictable from day to day, but it keeps its, its, its basic structure over a long period of time. And the key driver here, I would say, or a key factor in this is lack of trust. Your signature means nothing. Your word means very, very little. It's a low trust system in which everything is, is up for negotiation every day. It's also fractal in that the, the same types of negotiation and authority occurs at the lowest level, the village level, or operational level for, um, for military units, right up through the state, even to the interstate level. So we see this violence as bargaining in, in Chad on the left, in, in, in Yemen on the right. The former president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, described his country as ruling his country, he described as dancing on the heads of slaves. So in such a system, where are the handholds for human rights activism? 
our methods, our institutions just are not designed for this. Um, we try to pretend that these countries are transitioning to being something else, but actually they're not. If anything, many countries that were a bit like states are transitioning in that direction. This is Tahrir Square. The urban version of this marketplace is less violent. But there's an element of violence. It's not quite as, as embedded. It brings large numbers of people together momentarily. They can overthrow a state. Can they build anything in its place? The answer is, so far, they can't. Um, um, so we, we're not seeing political orders constructed that resemble those on which our human rights activism had some traction. We're seeing, if anything, the reverse. Now, what's driving this? Well, I call these rentier states, and the, there are many sources of rent. There's mineral rent from oil, as in Sudan. There's criminal rent, was important in Mali. You got money from the drug trade. There's aid rent in some countries, though aid is now pretty t tightly controlled. Aid, aid, aid is pretty robust uh, because the, the aid agencies cottoned onto this early. The biggest one is security rent. The biggest source of sustaining these sorts of systems is uh, security rent from multiple sources. From the, the Arab countries, you get... Um, Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia paying off uh, their clients, but above all, from the United States. Uh, the black budgets, and indeed some of the white budgets, some of the, 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 the military cooperation budgets, but the, the, the black budgets are very much behind this. The picture on the left is George Bush meeting Ali Abdullah Saleh in November 2005. Ali Abdullah Saleh had just defeated al-Qaeda in Yemen. And he went for a pat on the back and a congratulation from George Bush. And George Bush said, yes, congratulations, but your government is deeply corrupt, which is true. He didn't realize that it was that corruption that was keep, keeping the snakes fed and was, were, was eliminating al-Qaeda. And, and so George Bush said, well, we won't be giving you any counterterrorism support now because you've solved the problem, but go down the road, speak, speak to Andrew Natsios at USAID, and we'll give you some water programs. Um, a couple of months later, there was an uh, escape of 23 al-Qaeda prisoners from a maximum security jail, a jailbreak so audacious that everybody believes it was an insider job. Um, Al-Qaeda resumed its operations. Ali Abdullah Saleh got his security rents back. Business as usual continued. Um, on the right, we have uh, Yoweri Museveni, a military budget of $260 million, of which probably translates into about 40 or 50 million dollars of real spend. The rest of it is what he calls his political budget. It's for paying off people, also an element of personal corruption. Um, helped by the fact that he, he can't quite defeat this ragtag bag band of the Lord's Resistance Army a thousand miles away, but it's, rather, it, it, it's almost too good to be true because he has a rationale for maintaining a quarter of a million dollars quarter of a billion dollars of defense spending, and not only that, stationing his army in the mineral-rich, timber-rich neighboring countries with the blessing of the international community. Um, so, um, and of course, he was very, very happy when Invisible Children, those fellows on the top right, came out with their, with, with their video. It suited him well. I don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't think they were cynically motivated, but I do think they were um, misled and misleading. So the, one of the things that's happening is, is the funds that are, that, that are being channeled, and, and I say not just from the United States, there are many, many others too, and Gaddafi was possibly the worst offender when he was alive in, in much of Africa, but the United States is, is the biggest offender, are creating a global patronage system. It, it, it is like a limited access order. It is like you know, one of those old uh, pre-modern medieval orders in which loyalties are rented and in which the, 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 the business plan of the client is to defraud the, uh, the, the, the patron as much as possible, or at least to milk the patron as much as possible. And this is not a minor and regrettable side effect 
of, the fundamentally sound, of a fundamentally sound political logic of fighting terrorism and protecting American security. It is intrinsic to it. And we see this also in the militarization of US foreign policy. General David Petraeus referred to Ambassador Hol Richard Holbrook as, quote, my diplomatic wingman. And he meant it as a compliment. In what political system is the function of your most senior diplomat to raise resources to fund your military effort rather than the other way around, having your, your, your military generals pursuing a political strategy? Um, that was my main criticism of the plan to bomb Syria. Not that it was illegal, but that there was no political strategy. It was a military action in a political vacuum. And we can be sure that even while the government is shut down, these black budgets are probably not shut down. Um, the US, 42% of the world's military spending. Um, I it was President Eisenhower, who he was going to call it the military industrial congressional complex. He scratched out congressional um, in his, uh, before he delivered the speech. And drones, the, the, the logic of drones appears to be a logic that there's a finite number of bad people out there and if we can knock them off one by one, we'll make the world a safe place. Um, that's not how extremism works. It is rather regrettable, I think, that um, for reasons of electoral politics, the Obama administration has chosen to take as hard a line on defense and security as its predecessor. Um, actually, I should just mention why, why, um, why I put the picture of Saif al-Gaddafi up in that one. Um, Saif al-Gaddafi was spotted by a drone, a Sudanese drone. Um, two little lessons from that. One is that when the United States went to war to remove Colonel Gaddafi, you can't choose your allies. Well, the biggest ally on the ground was the Sudanese that supplied the intelligence and training to the Libyan forces on the ground, uh, a fact that neither side is willing to advertise. And the other point is that when you have drone technology, it doesn't stay your own technology indefinitely. The, the Sudanese do not yet have militarized drones, but they have... Uh, espionage drones, and one of them intercepted uh, Saif al-Gaddafi and handed him over to the Libyans. So my concluding point, really, is that the fir in my first part, I, I suggested that, the, 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 that there was a, a sorcerer's apprentice spawned from the human rights movement and the humanitarian movement, which have drawn back from their, their mutant offspring. And that... Mm, and, and honorably so, but that offspring is still there. And that is the, the, the idea of exceptionalism in pursuit of, of, of human rights, manifest in Syria. And then the, that converges with this other element of, of the story, which is that the nexus of the, you know, this global patronage system is the, the, the militarization of US global policy, including the, the, this shadow patronage system operating on these black budgets. Um, and, and I think there's a tremendous, a, a deep lack of uh, empathetic imagination at work. If the US government, when the Syrians had used, appeared to have used chemical weapons, if they, the, 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 if Samantha Power or Susan Rice, or President Obama, had had what it takes to be a global leader. You have to think what, how your actions are understood elsewhere. And there are two elements there. The first, of course, is that the U when the US president speaks about chemical weapons or weapons of mass destruction in an Arab country, it's taken with a pinch of salt in the rest of the world. You may be convinced, it may be true, but it is not taken at face value in the rest of the world, especially in the Middle East. Secondly, which country, I wonder, is the country in the world most viscerally and principally opposed to the use of chemical weapons? Which country has 25,000 chemical weapons victims still under regular hospital treatment after the consigned to dying a slow and painful death after they were gassed 
some 25 years ago. It's Iran. The, the bigger, I mean, we all know about Halabja, but the bigger number of chemical weapons victims in, that, in, the, in, in those years was, was Iran. And it would not have taken much imagination to say, here's a moment where we can actually make a real international red line and get the Iranians and the Russians, who are also appalled by this, on our side, instead of thinking it is having the reflex, it is the US responsibility to act alone illegal, politically vacuous, and lacking that basic sensibility about the fact that we live in, 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 in a world where you have to take account of, of, of other people's views. Um, the, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that the, for me, the, 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 the if, if we begin to look at this global system as a system, as a system of power, with those elements of resources, of, of um, violence, and of communication and convening, it is the, the principal responsibility I submit of the human rights movement, particularly here in the United States, in the coming years, to look at the, the misuse of power, and especially to return to that initial struggle that defined the human rights movement and social movements 200, 200, 250 years ago, which is the power of convening and communication. The fact that this government has taken upon itself the authority to control, to have access to ownership of every single bit of, of digital information that it can get access to is to me um, extraordinary. And, 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 and needs, I think, to be challenged. And as it is challenged, I would, I would submit that the American human rights movement can then become, can then take its place in the vanguard of a global human rights movement in pursuit of civil globalization. Thank you. Professor Duvall has agreed to take some questions. I'll moderate, but let me just say as a first comment that we convened this conference and, and uh, we've been thinking about a center. We believe that if we're going to address human rights issues, we need to address structural causes. And I, we just heard this brilliant analysis of, of very deep structural changes in the world that, to which we must be attentive if we're going to, to have any hope to uh, uh, create a more decent world order. So with that, I'm going to uh, acknowledge people. Please um, approach the microphones. Uh, please keep your questions uh, 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 brief, and um, we'll go for perhaps 15 minutes. Mm Um, I, um, the, the question was, is there in any instance in which a unilateral action, uh, military action by, uh, by a state uh, in, in response to grave human rights crimes could do, could do good? Um, hypothetically, yes. I wouldn't want to rule it out. Um, I've not seen, I've not come across an example, and Syria was certainly not such an example, nor was Libya. Um, it's pretty rare to find an example in which that would happen. Um, the conditions under which it, um, it could happen, leaving aside, I'm mean, putting the legal issues on one side. Um, there are a couple of considerations. One is there would have to be a political strategy for a solution. There is no purely military solution to anything. So if it were in support of a, a political strategy. And I think one also needs to weigh the, the efficacy of, the immediate efficacy 
of such an action against the damage that would be done to, to international law because part of, part of the efficacy of an action would be its consequences in international law. And for example, let me give you an example. The, one of the, when the UN Security Council passed resolution 1973 on Libya, with the imminent uh, overrunning of Benghazi and a possible massacre. There was a lot of support for that. The, the, and it was passed, and the, the, the resolution very specifically said the, the objective was not regime change. Actually, the objective was regime change. Now, the problem with that act of deceit, it may have been successful in removing Gaddafi, but one of the repercussions of that in terms of the efficacy of international law was that the Russians said, we're going to block every resolution on Syria. So you see a connection between the two. That would have to be weighed in, in, in making such a calculation. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your comments and for being here. Uh, my question is with regards to human rights education, as many of us in the room here from Dayton and many other places are committed to uh, educating youth about, particularly Americans, uh, on human rights and advocacy. And there are many students here as well. And so I'm wondering uh, what advice you have or um, concrete ways of thinking about how do we be critical about America's position in terms of human rights? Uh, in ways that are um, motivating and not paralyzing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, think, I think the starting point is to make it clear that human rights is not about going after the bad guys like Omar al-Bashir and Gaddafi and, and Bashar al-Assad and, and so on. It's also about calling our friends to account, our friends, our former colleagues. It's, it, it, it's not about the attractiveness of an issue, it's about uh, a principle. And the place where human rights activism is most effective is in these mature, developed, democratic states where there is rule of law. I mean, uh, if uh, one of the arguments, um, the Syria argument really boiled down in, in the end to it's about American credibility. Um, America has put itself out there, it needs to be credible. And, uh, and if the world needs a policeman, Personally, I would prefer that it is the United States than it is Russia or China. I'd rather have a, 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 you know, a, a, a system that is bound by constitutionalism with it, that self-writing mechanism. I mean, at least you know, the extent of the, 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 national, you know, the, the NSA surveillance, at least it came out. It wouldn't come out in many countries. And, and there is a backlash. And I hope it, it, you know, it's a backlash that we can all contribute to. Um, but the argument for a world's policeman is not a human rights argument. It's a different kind of argument. And, 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 uh, and I think that um, it, it's important that human rights, human rights act education makes that distinction quite clear. I think, I, 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 I think there's a danger of, of regarding everything good as human rights. Hello. Is this on? <laughs> Hi, I'm Danielle Fultz, and I'm a senior at Ohio University. Uh, thank you so much for your talk this evening. It was spectacular. Um, to build off the first question a little bit, um, with the atrocities that happened in Rwanda, um, I believe that a lot of people critique the lack of military intervention um, for the amount of deaths that mm -hmm. occurred. Um, the United States did not come. Um, because of what happened in Sudan um, before. Um, and so I was wondering um, if you're saying that military intervention um, is not a good human rights policy, how do we um, prevent similar atrocities from happening in Syria um, without a, um, intervention, a military intervention? Okay. Um, Syria and Rwanda are very, very different. Is, is, yes. is the starting point. I mean, the, the problem in Syria is too much intervention. Everyone's intervening. There was no one in, in Rwanda. The, the, um, one of the elements in, in Syria 
is that if the Assad regime loses on the battlefield, the Alawites will probably be wiped out. Um, the solution to Syria is, 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 is peace. And it looks as though now the two sides, or the many sides, realize they cannot win militarily. So, they, so the solution is a, is a peace conference, not an intervention. In the case of Rwanda, um, I, was, I was involved in, in, in Rwanda at the time as it was unfolding, uh, myself and my colleague Rakia, and we did not support a military intervention. What we, said, what we supported was, we said the, what would be efficacious is to support the Rwandese Patriotic Front, which is winning the war, speed up its winning. And that will do two things. Number one, it'll end the massacres. And number two, if the RPF does not feel it has been abandoned by the world, but feels it has been supported by the world, then it will owe the world a debt, and it will have the confidence of the rest of the world and will engage in hopefully constructive policies. As it was, the RPF felt it had won the war, it was a, a Rwandese solution, um, but it, it, that it had been abandoned. And there was that bitter estrangement between it and the rest of the world, which was a contributor to the, a major contributor to the war in Congo. Thank you. Um, I think I have the microphone. <laughs> I'll pass it over there. Uh, I had a question about judicial responses. And uh, particularly, you know, you were been very critical of the prosecutor of the ICC's decision to indict uh, Bashir. But, and, and, but putting that aside for a second, I'm curious about your, your general thoughts about uh, judicial responses, criminal responses in Africa in the, in the medium to long term. I mean, will we see, what will we see happen with the ICC? Uh, what do we want to see happen with the ICC? And in fact, should we be hoping for, looking for, expecting African court to emerge of some, in some form or another, uh, what would that look like? So, uh, you know, a little bit of reflection on your, whether or not you saw the same position about Bashir, I, I assume you do, um, but, but also, you know, where, where we're heading in terms of judicial responses to yeah. mass atrocity in Africa. Yeah. Um, I think um, Moreno Ocampo had made the remarkable achievement of, of uh, issuing an arrest warrant for President Bashir for the one crime of which he was not guilty. Um, and if, if one of my, the students in my class had presented that arrest warrant as a term paper, I would have given it a fail and sent it back. It had the names of tribes wrong. It had evidence relating to previous governments of which Bashir had no relation to. I mean, it was a real mess. That it was, it, it, the guy would have been acquitted, and that would have been worse. Um, the that, that was my main charge against it. I also felt that the the um, I was part. I was I was a staff member for the African Union panel on Darfur, which was headed by President Mbeki, and Mbeki had a very interesting line on this. Um, and he and, and and he. I remember him taking aside some of the Darfur rebels, who uh, who accosted him and said, "You're you, you, you know you're supporting the government against the ICC." And 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 and, and Mbeki said, "I never said anything publicly on the ICC, which was true." He said, "But let me tell you um, my own experience." And he would he would talked about in the late 1980s, 88, 89, when the ANC. Uh, decide, was debating to whether to enter into negotiations with the apartheid government in South Africa. And the UN General Assembly had, had declared that apartheid was a crime against humanity. In fact, it's there in the Rome Statute. Apartheid is one of the crimes. Um, and most of the, of the rank and file of the ANC were, took the line, uh, the world is behind us. The, um, the only place for those leaders of apartheid is in the dock and in jail or dead. You know, we won't compromise because of this. And, and they, they had other reasons for not compromising. And, and Becky and others took the line. They said, look, our political goal as the ANC from our foundation in 1913 has been one, and it, and it has never changed. It is a democratic, non-racial South Africa. And we're going to get there. One way or another, we'll get there. We can fight, and it will take 30 years. We can negotiate and get there in five years. And our view as the leadership, have they discussed it, was that we will negotiate. We will set aside this issue of the criminalization of apartheid. We will have a Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and we will 
you know, negotiate them down and we will then achieve our strategic goal. And what Mbeki said to the, to the, the Darfur rebels was, work out what is your strategic goal. If it is to get Bashir in, 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 in the Hague, that's fine. That's your goal. You go for it. But if, what I understand from your goal it is to have peace and reconciliation and development and, and justice in Darfur. So figure out how those things will go together. And if you, the Sudanese, all agree that the president should go to the court, then, it, then two things. First of all, it should happen, and secondly, it will happen. But if you don't agree, then it will be, it will, it will be politically divisive for somebody to send him or for him to be snatched. It will hap if that happens, then you will have a crisis in Sudan. So first establish that political consensus, and then it can happen. Now, that was the most articulate version of the you know, let's go slow on the ICC argument, and I, I, I personally was persuaded by that. There is the, you know, this unfortunate argument, oh, the, um, you know, the ICC is hunting Africans, etc., which is, which is just cheap propaganda. And then the, the, the Kenyans say, well, you know, we voted these guys in. Therefore, the people support them. And I, that's also a mm, slightly dodgy argument because the reason why they, Kenyatta and Ruto, went, ran on the same ticket was precisely in order, you know, the solidarity of the dam. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that the, the, the Africans are mishandling this. They're talking about a special AU summit to withdraw from the ICC. The ICC is also not handling it well. They're being quite insensitive to African concerns. Um, I normally don't like microphones, but I'm assuming this is, yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. I was hoping that you would clarify a bit what you meant by the power of convening and communication. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm, I'm curious about this is I feel that we have a lot of communication. Um, I find it problematic in terms of the filtering and the explaining and the, the kind of pedagogical role that could take place with communication. Um, and, and information regarding human rights issues. So I was hoping you could speak okay. more about that. Okay, the, um, this is an area that is remarkably under-theorized, under and I think it, it's really a challenge for, for scholars um, to look at it. Um, and, I, and I see it practically. I mean, and, and the, you know, I, I, in, ter I mean in, in terms of us generally, there's masses of information, and when there's, you know, we're, we have information overload. What, what I was specifically referring to in the context of the, you know, Africa and the greater Middle East is the, the ability of a rebel commander to get on the phone. And it's just one communication. How much are you offering? How do we coordinate tomorrow or whatever? These very, ta very targeted, very specific, very tactical, but very weak links. Extra that's an extraordinary uh, tool that these, uh, that these people have. It doesn't translate into, into a strategic alternative. And, 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 and I, haven't, I must say, I haven't got my head around what, what the, the profusion of communication actually, um, actually means. It clearly it means that you can have you know, m moments of extraordinarily effective coordination, of practical coordination. I, I'm, I'm talking about impact on, 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 on political process. Um, you know, which cuts through all, all you know, I'm sure 99% of, of, of communication has no bearing at all on any political process, but the 1% the or the 1% of 1% that does is very, very um, um, important. And I think, but I think we, uh, we need to begin to get an answer to this, and maybe an answer is just about to come. <laughs> This on? Yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, your closing points about the threats, you know, with surveillance and uh, mm. those issues. Uh, what do you see as a potentially effective response to that problem? Uh, you talk about communication, information, and the surveillance situation. Um, I think it has to be made illegal. Um, I think it needs to be stopped, and the. And, and I think there needs to be a, a, a change in the strategic mindset. And um, I'm the director of the World Peace Foundation. When I was offered the job, I, I thought, can I seriously go around telling people I run the World Peace Foundation? You know, you know, well, you know believing in world peace is something for beauty queens, you know? And I'm not. 
nor am I likely to be. Um, so, but you know, the World Peace Foundation was founded in 1910 at a time when it was quite legitimate to talk about world peace. And, and you know, US political leaders could say, our national interests are served by world peace and a, a, a lower defense budget, a, a, you know, a, a very much reduced military posture. And our strategic goal as the World Peace Foundation is to make that conversation possible again. To say, actually, you know, the, the United States, you know, 42% of the world's military spending, you know, as much military power as the next 14 nations put together. Um, you know, it, control o over means of communication commensurate to that. Economic power, I mean, still, you know, much more fungible economic power than, than, than China, even if China is, 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 is getting there. Um, you know, what's, what's the US so scared of? You know, you know, why, you know why, why is my seven-year-old son searched in airports? I mean, you know, it's because his mother's a Muslim. I mean, it's, you know, We're going to have to make that the, the last question of the, <laughs> the evening. The NSA uh, is listening to that. <laughs> uh, this Can we just take one more? Sure, I'm sure. <laughs> You're in charge. Okay, I have a question that relates to what you were talking about was the relationship between human rights and humanitarianism. Yeah. Um, how do you react to the strategy that a lot of humanitarian groups have taken, which is uh, we're working for the you know, human right to food, the human right to physical integrity, the human right to whatever, um, which is you know, trying to, in a sense, yeah. marry and integrate the human rights and humanitarian. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's very, it's not only respectable, it's actually very necessary because you know, for, for, for many people around the world, you know, human rights are to do with bread and butter issues, literally. And, and, and they don't understand that, um, that distinction. And, 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 I'm, and I must say, you know, I, I think that the, the humanitarian agencies have become very sophisticated about this. My particular concern, and, 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 and maybe I should have expressed it more clearly, was that there was a particular historic moment about 20 years ago when in the immediate post-Cold War era, both the humanitarians and the human rights people were struggling to find their way. And out of this came this you know, out, out of this um, casual encounter, let's put it, came, came this mutant offspring. <laughs> and, 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 and since then, they've both grown up and thought, mm, thought better, and, and, and both the parents have sort of <laughs> become, uh, become much more sober and, and, and sophisticated and mature, but this mutant offspring has, has, is, 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 is causing havoc around the world, um, unfortunately. Well, that will be it. This could go on forever. <laughs> but, you know, it will continue tomorrow. Uh, the conference on the social practice of human rights continues tomorrow with plenary sessions. Um, Professor Duvall will uh, participate again. We will also hear from our uh, other keynote speaker, uh, Juan Mendez, uh, the university's first Romero recipient. He will be uh, participating via video because uh, as UN Special Rapporteur on torture, he has uh, he's been called to, uh, to New York, but uh, you'll hear from uh, Juan Mendez tomorrow. Plenaries, again, with Dr. DeWall and, and others. Uh, so we invite you uh, to come back. Uh, before I ask you to join me in uh, uh, thanking and applauding um, Professor, again, let me give a special thanks for a couple of people. At the beginning of this, we saw uh, a video about the legacy of uh, human rights uh, program here at the University of Dayton, and I want to particularly thank two people, Michael Kurtz, who put the video together, and Nick Carlino, who wrote the song in, what, 48 hours when I went into your office and said I need a song, and I think he may have had it, but I want to thank uh, uh, Mike and, and you, Nick, for, for doing that. I, th I think it was spectacular. And now, please join me in thanking Professor DeWitt.